Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bobby Ademeka. I'm a um, portfolio manager on our global infrastructure strategy at Jenison Associates, also uh, co-head of the income and investment team there. And I'm pleased to be joined uh, by Zach Davis, the uh, chief investment officer, a uh, chief financial officer, sorry, uh, of the Chenier Energy. Um, it's been almost 10 years of exactly. Chenier for you. Yes. Uh, three years in the CFO seat. That's right. Uh, so thank you so much for, for joining. Um, so uh, I guess maybe just getting started, um, you know, we've got a, you know, a couple different uh, topic areas to, to hit on um, and maybe kind of start with the, uh, the business model at, at Chenier, uh, which I think is, uh, you know, fascinating and, and, and still even, you know, 13 years into the decision uh, to start the uh, LNG export uh, platform. Uh, still, I think there's, you know, some misunderstandings there. Um, for me, uh, you know, I think one of the kind of most underlooked and under, uh, undervalued and underappreciated aspects of Chenier's uh, investment uh, story is the resiliency of the cash flows. Um, so I'm hoping uh, that maybe you can shed a little bit of light on kind of the key underpinnings of the, of the business model for Chenier that, you know, um, uh, that underpin uh, your ability to fund significant new liquefaction capacity uh, without issuing new equity while returning meaningful cash flow to shareholders uh, through dividends and buybacks, while also uh, maintaining uh, investment grade uh, status at all three rating agencies. So if you could peel back the onion a little Goodness bit. Gracious. For us all right. uh, I'm glad we don't let you ask questions on the earnings call. <laughs> That was about 15 questions in one. Um, well, well, thank you for having me. Uh, ha happy to be here. And just to give a little background to those that might not know as much about Chenier. Um, it, we're, we're the LNG company, the ticker's LNG. Um, we're, we're the one exporting the gas a, a, out of the country. But uh, when I started working with Chenier, I was actually at CS in New York. And it was an import story. It was the idea that uh, there wasn't going to be enough gas in this country. So we were gonna to have to import it from Trinidad or um, even Russia at, at, at the time. So we were building uh, an import terminal and right when it got online, the shale revolution occurred and things were looking pretty dire for this, uh, for this company. And when things are sometimes dire, you come up with your best idea. And the idea was to turn it around. And, and become an export story with the excess gas in, in this country. Uh, basically, when I joined the company or even when I was a banker for it, the stock was around $1. Uh, it had a, a precipitous fall uh, with, with the shale revolution. Stocks 10 years later, it's hovering for the last year or so in the 160s. So it, it's been a heck of a ride. Chenier is now Fortune 122, Global Fortune 450. Um, it's a $40 billion market cap, $70 billion enterprise, uh, third largest company not in the S&P 500 uh, at this time. Um, so, so, so that should come. And operationally, we consume around 10% of all the natural gas in the United States. So every day, our two plants, one in, uh, one in Louisiana at Sabine Pass and one in Texas at Corpus, uh, take in around seven to eight BCF a day of gas, and the country as a whole produces about 100 bees a day. Uh, that amounts to around over 50% of all of the LNG exports out of the United States, and over 10% of all the LNG exports worldwide. So we're the second largest operator now, and it, it, it's, been a, it's been a heck of a story, and getting into some of your questions, uh, re really what has been at the foundation of this thing has been the long-term contracts. We have these contracts that are, are, are basically, whether you need the product or not for 20 years, you'll pay us a fixed fee. And that fixed fee alone can cover our operating costs, our debt service, and earn a return. Uh, if you wanna lift uh, the LNG, you pay Henry Hub on top of the fixed fee. That's a pass-through to allow us to go acquire it in, in, in the market. 
And uh, that's the story. We basically went on this um, historic infrastructure bill, uh, build uh, and spent around $40 billion. And our name wasn't Exxon or Chevron. Uh, how we did it was we raised around $32 billion of debt or about 80% of, of the whole build out was with debt. And you can imagine we were probably one of the biggest high yield issuers for about a decade. Um, quite popular in, the, in, in, in these neck of the woods for a while. Um, and, and, and basically we were only able to do that because these contracts with customers all over the world were pretty rock solid that we were going to be able to earn a return regardless of the commodity environment. And for example, in 2020, uh, LNG prices uh, around the world were around $3. LNG, gas prices in, in, in this country were even 2 to $3 as well. There was no profit to be made. And with the fixed fees that we get for about 90 to 95% of our capacity, uh, we were able to meet guidance that year, make it through, refinance our debt, and, and be in a solid position going forward. Fast forward two years later, and thanks to, we, we've been able to get more capacity out of our uh, liquefaction uh, trains. Uh, we were able to bring them on early uh, with, with our partners at Bechtel who built all of our infrastructure. We had excess capacity to sell in 2022. And with that, uh, yeah, we were able to make around $11.5 billion EBITDA or about $600, $6 billion of incremental profit. Uh, allowed us to get to invest in grade as a company, pay down around $7 billion of debt over the last two years. And now we are looking into the future and it still comes back to those same long-term contracts that you were speaking to before. However, instead of using those long-term contracts to, to raise debt, we're using that to fund our equity. And with the visibility you have with these long-term contracts, um, yeah, it gives us a ton of flexibility to do so. So it's, it's been a, a wild ride. I, I'm a New Yorker uh, through and through. I told my wife we'd move to Texas and this thing probably wouldn't work out in two years or so. And now we have three Texan girls. So uh, we're, we're, we're probably there for the long haul. Well, as a native New Yorker who's never really left, uh, I thank you for being bold and making that decision that's, that's worked out for our fund holders uh, in, in a great way. Um, I guess we'll get back to the strength of those cash flows and, and how it's allowed you to um, have a pretty robust capital allocation plan. But I guess maybe kind of just sticking on the, the business model for a second. You know, as you mentioned, you know, the ticker for Chenier Energy is LNG. For good reason, you know, through all your successes um, over the last, you know, decade plus, uh, Chenier has become, you know, quite synonymous with all things LNG. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of good that's attached to that. You know, one of the things that I wish was a little bit different is just sometimes the stock trades as if people think they're trading spot LNG. Yeah. And uh, to me, it suggests, you know, a, a lack of understanding uh, about exactly how Chenier makes its, its, its uh, cash flow. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about how the business model um, you know, addresses uh, spot price, spot LNG price volatility, sure. what you do to, to mitigate that. Sure. So we, we try to communicate. I mean, th this is just not your typical public company. We're, we're, we're quite, a, quite a large public company at, at, at this point, and it was a, a unique way to raise so much money in, in so many different ways. I mean, two of our biggest uh, in, investors are these two uh, infrastructure funds in Blackstone and Brookfield were their biggest investments. Um, so so we, we've, we've had a unique story in the capital markets for, for quite some time. And uh, being this ticker LNG, uh, now mo mo more, more and more people know about this company by the day, especially after what happened in 2022 when Europe had no access to, to, to Russian gas anymore. And we actually had budget meetings last week and Randy, my head of IR's budget went up because now we have to send out double the amount of annual reports because that's how many more investors are now in, in, involved in the story. Uh, so, so, that, so that is a good thing, but at the same time, we get a lot of questions on earnings calls at conferences like the one I'll do tomorrow at, at 
it, basically, what do you think about the prices for next month? What do you think is going to happen early next year on LNG prices? And, and, and basically, this company doesn't exist if we were a merchant open capacity company that was just beholden to that uh, price on the Bloomberg screen. That's how we were able to raise so much debt and ensure that that debt could be repaid over time. And that's why, uh, yeah, companies in the oil and gas space that are mainly uncontracted get valued at four to five times, maybe six if they're uh, the premier operator. And a, a bad multiple for us is 10 times uh, because our cash flows go out for 20 years and are, and are pretty rock solid with inflation protection regardless of the commodity environment. So we, we try not, you, you can't be in this business spending tens upon tens of billions of dollars and just hoping for the best with the commodity. And, and that's where those contracts come into play. So I, 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 on the last earnings call, I said, look, I, 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 I obviously know what the LNG price is day to day, what TTF, the ga European gas price is, or JKM, the Japanese gas price is, and Henry Hub. Uh, but then I look at EBITDA every day and it doesn't change. And our guidance is rock solid because it comes back to those contracts. So I, I think sometimes people like to make this into something more sexy than it is. It's just like two uh, massive project financings that we've done mm. uh, of a product that's pretty much in the money in, in all parts of the world. Well, as listed infrastructure investors, we appreciate the value of boring. So uh, yeah. Well, I'd, keep it going. I'd root for some of the other LNG operators to be as public as we are with quarterly earnings calls and, 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 and hold themselves as, as accountable uh, because it's, it's, it's a lot tougher. Um, yeah, you said I, I, I've been at Chenier for, for three years as CFO. We, we, we don't call it years. It's 13 earnings calls. That's, that, that's how you uh, calculate your time as CFO. Understood. Um, so you touched on last year on 2022, um, a dynamic year in the LNG industry, to say the least, um, you know, I guess kind of highlighted or notably due to the knock on effects from uh, Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine and the impact that had on energy prices broadly. Um, I guess I was just wondering if you can talk about how um, that event and European demand in general has impacted Chenier's outlook for global demand uh, developing over the next several years and, and how has that impacted the environment for negotiating and secure, securing uh, new commercial commitments? Sure, so I, I, I don't think this was ever part of the base case that there would be such a, a, an event where um, uh, eventually, as, as it turned out, that if Chenier, this company of 1,500 people in Houston, Texas, with just two plants, one in Louisiana and, and, and one in Texas, uh, were, were its own country, it provided more LNG to Europe than any other country in the world last year. It all went there. Um, and when, when, when Randy and I go uh, all over Europe now, because we have a lot more interest uh, in other parts of the world, in the story, uh, they're, they're not just interested in, in investing in this company, but grateful for what we were able to accomplish mm -hmm. uh, for, for the continent. So, so that was huge. At the same time, it, it, it's still, there's still tons of headwinds in, in the policies. Um, and basically in the last year or so, there's been a lot of long-term contracting but most of the long-term contracting for LNG has been super majors and portfolio players. That alone has been 50% of all the long-term contracts. So basically they can see out that if you have a net zero target of 2030, 2035, 2040, 2045, what have you, there's going to be a need for baseload energy that is clearly the cleanest uh, available and reliable, and it's gonna be LNG or gas. And they will sign up the long-term deals with their credit ratings with, with folks like us. Mm -hmm. And then they will sell on a shorter term or in the spot market at these elevated prices to European utilities that don't have um, the government support to sign up these long-term deals, even though it would have been an absolute no-brainer. Uh, just to put in perspective, 
the, the prices that we were selling, the, the minimum open capacity we had, the 5% or so, was uh, around $40 per MMBTU of margin. So one cargo a day could make actually $150 million of profit and we ship two a day. Um, we only made six billion of, of incremental profit because we were 95% contracted. But if you had a contract with us, you would be paying $2.50. Um, so you, you, you'd be paying a 10th mm -hmm. or, or even less. Uh, so, so, so basically that, that, that is an issue that was driving the market for some time but there was thawing in long-term contracting because a lot of these folks could see out further and that there was a huge opportunity, a clear opportunity for, for LNG. The other big uh, uh, dynamic is China. China is 20% of all the long-term contracting that's been done. We just signed a few deals. One goes out to 2050. They're basically a portfolio player as well. Most of their LNG over the past year has gone to Europe at the elevated prices. And what do they do? They turn back on the coal and are just optimizing price and knowing that they have enough energy security for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so so, so that, that, that has been an issue in terms of winning over direct European companies that we used to be able to win them over left and right as we got this thing started a decade ago. But we see some thawing. And, and, and some of that has been with, with some big players. Our last contract that we signed goes to 2045 with BASF who's delivering this LNG into Germany. Germany didn't even have a regas terminal to, to take in LNG a year ago. Uh, and, and, and they definitely didn't have a net zero target that goes into the 2040s. Now they're in a position to sign a deal with us going out to 2045. We've also done a deal with Anji uh, recently in the last year, as well as Equinor, the Norwegians. All three of those companies are government owned. So, so there is progress occurring. Uh, it's just that they're, it's a little slower and it, it is probably not as large as it should be. Mm -hmm. But as we look out further uh, in terms of this, this market, the LNG market is still pretty small. Um, uh, the LNG market is 400 million tons, which is only around like 3% of, of, of global energy. Uh, and, and gas as a whole is about 25%, but it's only 3%. And the market is set to go to 700 million tons, not even double uh, by, by 2040. That's as, as, as big as it can be because these projects are really expensive to build and they take a lot of time. Back a few years back, we thought there would be three supply hubs for, for new LNG, the US with our excess gas and a, a ability to get it to the coasts, um, Russia and Qatar. Now there's only two. And in terms of the demand for this LNG, because that had to be met, for the most part, it was all coming from Asia. It was about 75% Asia. China was a, a quarter uh, of it. Then there was Southeast Asia and then South Asia. That makes up about three quarters. And the rest was scattered around the world. Now with the dynamics in, in, in Europe, they're almost going to double their import capacity. They're going from like a little less than 150 million tons of import terminals to 250 million tons in the next few years, really within the, before the end of the decade. Um, so, so now there's an extra like, demand node and one less supply node. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting setup for a company that can provide this LNG. Yeah, so that's, I guess, a good segue into maybe the supply outlook. Um, so, you know, I, I believe the US uh, was the, the uh, largest LNG exporter during the first half of this year. And like you said, it's basically gonna be US and Qatar uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so, you know, against that very robust demand uh, picture that you, global demand picture that you painted, you know, unsurprisingly, we're seeing a response in terms of proposed projects, many out of the US. Uh, US currently has roughly 90 million tons per annum of capacity. And uh, according to some estimates I've seen, you're looking at about 80 million tons per annum uh, under construction currently. Uh, that includes uh, stage three at Corpus at yep. uh, 10, a uh, little, um, uh, little, little over, little Definitely over, yes. okay, <laughs> yeah. I like it. Um, so I guess, the, and, and then on top of it, so that's what's under construction. There's another 130 M, uh, MT uh, PA, 
uh, on, on the books, looking to get permit and, and whatnot. So obviously, you know, supply is coming. Uh, and you know, the, you know, the supply comes in stages. Uh, you uh, often uh, see concerns given the, um, you know, the cyclical nature of the LNG history, uh, of the LNG industry historically, you have booms, busts, and what have you. So I guess where I'm going with this is, um, in terms of competitive advantages for Chenier uh, against that very uh, competitive backdrop, Mm -hmm. Kind of, you know, what do you what do you see as you know Chenier's competitive advantages uh, relative to uh, potential customers? And and then it should be noted that against that backdrop that I just painted, uh, you know, Chenier has been very successful historically, continues to be successful this year. I think you've already secured nearly five five million tons this year um, of new contracts. Right, ten which, last year. Right, yeah. and and at least, and I know that you know some of last year went to FID on stage three and some of this five should, from this year should go towards more expansion. No, more expansion. Yeah. So you've obviously done well. And I guess what we're getting, where I'm going with this is, you know, what, what do you point to as kind of the, the underpinning that sort of success uh, commercially? Sure. So a lot of folks want to be in this business and a lot of folks have got into what we call the starting line, which is FID. Um, we, we have a good amount of stuff going for us, being the first movers. Um, we have the largest relationship with Bechtel, the premier EPC contractor of the world that has done many of these LNG projects. We locked up a lot of the pipeline capacity in the country that we're the biggest customer of Kinder and of Williams. Um, and and with, with contracts for 20 years with extension rights for pipelines that can get to any basin east of the Rockies, including all the way to Canada. Um, and, and then we already spent $40 billion. <laughs> so there's always an advantage to the scale and we call it a brownfield advantage where you can build off of what you have to get better economics. Um, and, then, and then just the, uh, the operating track record that we delivered through 2020, we delivered through 2022 and held to those $2.50 contracts when you could have made 40, mm -hmm. um, says a lot. And that's why we have a lot of repeat customers that keep on coming back to us like Equinor or ENN or PetroChina uh, recently. And if you're someone like BASF who's relying on a certain amount of gas through thick or thin, they went to us and even pay a premium to work with us over others that are, are more of upstarts. Mm -hmm. What we don't have going for us is we are a publicly listed uh, infrastructure company uh, that is already incredibly successful. And anything that is not uh, demonstrably accretive to that story is just more risk or, or, or going the wrong way in terms of creating value on a daily, monthly, quarterly, annual, decade long um, like value proposition. Uh, so the standard that we have to live with is a lot harder than some of these folks that are willing to take whatever money possible, take whatever contract they can get just to be relevant or be part of the business. It's hard for us to poo-poo it too much considering that's where we were 10 years ago, but uh, where we are today, uh, we have some advantages, but we better hold to that line or, or we have no business allocating capital to, to growth like that where I could pay a, a larger dividend or uh, buy back the stock and let folks just own these two assets for the long term. So other projects are gonna get done. It's not about market share for us. It's about that stock and not coming back to this like in a year and the stock's still at 160. Um, it, it, it's about value. And uh, that, that if we stay focused on that, we basically look at projects that we can build on a CapEx to EBITDA basis. It's a simple way to, to just uh, set everyone, even folks at my company, on what they should target to around even seven times. As I mentioned to you before, if we can be um, uh, valued at 10 to 12 times on a run rate basis, there, there's a lot of value there. If I can raise 50% of, of the funds with debt, uh, that's only three and a half times debt. That's deeply investment grade uh, for, for, for our space. And I can get a 10% unlevered return. Um, with all those contracts. So we will do that all day, but whatever happens month to month or year to year with the commodity markets, like 
it, it is what it is and we should be expecting the volatility, but we will make those returns because we have these contracts and we'll just have some incremental upside when things are a little brighter than that. Okay. Just looking at time, um, I might skip ahead and uh, hit capital allocation because I'm sure it's something that a lot of people are interested in. Uh, so last fall, uh, you know, you came out with a very comprehensive kind of quote unquote, all of the above approach to capital allocation, uh, talking about growth, talking about paying down debt, um, and maintaining and solidifying investment grade ratings, as well as capital return to shareholders. I was wondering if you could maybe kind of talk a little bit about where you see that plan today mm -hmm. and particularly how it may evolve as stage three of corpus comes on or sure. you know, Sabine Pass expansion progresses. So in, in September last year, we came out with something called the 2020 vision. And it, it basically said by through 2026, uh, with, with just the assets that we have, we'll generate over $20 billion of available cash. And with that, we can eventually get to $20 per share of distributable cash flow. When you think about cash flow per share, um, at least 10 times. So that's a fun number to think about as we, we, we try to uh, and obviously create more value and, and, and get the stock price up over time uh, sustainably. So to, to achieve that, it's going to be an all of the above type approach that now I feel like everybody talks about. But uh, what, what it is, is we're going to invest in growth. We're going to pay down debt to uh, solidify the balance sheet. We're going to start a dividend, which we didn't even have two years ago, um, and then grow it. And, and, and then we're gonna have a buyback program. So we were able to FID last year, another $7 billion project over 10 million tons uh, to increase the size of our, our, our company by, by another quarter uh, in, in terms of its operating capacity. Uh, we committed to a $4 billion buyback program that was basically gonna buy back around 10% of the stock. Um, we, we started a dividend uh, the year prior, increased it by 20%, and have committed to increasing it by 10% for another five years or so. Um, and, and then on top of all that, we were gonna pay down debt to get to investment grade. This company that used to be one of the most levered companies in all of energy, uh, often laughed at, was gonna to get to investment grade. And basically that, that, that's what we did. And over the last six months, we, we pretty much uh, overloaded those rating agencies with that pay down that they had to give it to us. And, and now we're investing great everywhere by, by all the agencies. Um, so what's the evolution? As these, the growth projects come online, there's gonna be even more cash flow. The ratings are intact. They probably can be not just maybe triple B minus, but triple B with a little more debt pay down, but sustainably investing grade. The dividend will keep on tracking up over time and there's gonna be a big buyback program because people really believe in the story that are in it. They don't just believe in it for the next year or two, but they believe that we'll be around and relevant till 2050 or beyond. So we're gonna let them own a little more of, of Sabine and Corpus incrementally over time. What you'll see is, is maybe a dial back of the debt pay down once we're solidly investment grade and sustainably there, where we can focus on the three pillars mainly uh, so long as that uh, those investment grade ratings are completely intact. So you could see us uh, reconsider what the payout ratio needs to be on the dividend, probably another upsize of the buyback program. And ideally, uh, we have in the works the ability to probably increase the capacity of the company again by another 30, 40 percent. Uh, so, so, so that's all in the works and hopefully more updates to come in the next two years or so on that. Okay. Excellent. Uh, understanding that we're standing in between everyone and uh, cocktails, uh, maybe open it up for a couple of questions if there are any. Okay, I probably shouldn't have prefaced it that way. They want their cocktails. Uh, I'm gonna yes. I'm gonna ask one okay. more question. Sure. Um, so obviously, very opportunity opportunity rich on an organic uh, basis is, I guess, how, if at all, does M&A factor into the Chenier story, either as an acquirer or as, as a seller? Um, sure. I think there was a time where people were thinking Chenier could be bought um, by a big midstream company. 
but basically we're as big or bigger than most of them now. Um, so, th so that would, that wouldn't really be an acquisition. Mm -hmm. So that, that wouldn't be as interesting to this company. And then basically we not, we might not fit the perfect mold of, of the super majors that are basically the only ones that could afford the size of this today. Uh, j just because they, they, they like the full spectrum from upstream all the way to downstream and, and we're really a midstream infrastructure asset. So uh, I, I think we'll be gainfully employed for some time um, on, on, on that front. On the acquisition front, it's pretty tough when you have the organic growth inside of our uh, real estate uh, to grow from. There, there's a lot of risk in this business when you're talking about tens upon tens of billions of dollars to get these things done. Uh, so, so that's not really a risk we, we need to take. And it, it, if we were even open to that, everyone else in LNG would love to get the Chenier valuation um, or the Chenier multiple. And that, 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 that doesn't sound like it'll be that accretive to us. Mm -hmm. So we're going to stick to what we do. And I, and I think that's what makes this so, so unique that we're an infrastructure company of two assets and every single employee at the company is supporting those two assets. And if they're not, I'd love to know who their manager is because that's all we do. And I think that focus has really set us apart and allowed us uh, to, to, to be able to, to achieve what we've been able to achieve this past decade. Excellent. Uh, please join me in thanking Zach for sharing his time with us. Thank you.